Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Jeff Burnside. I'm an investigative reporter for Como TV News, and it's my job to try to moderate these guys tonight. I have no idea what they're going to be saying tonight. You, you and I are going to learn for the first time as they get going here. But we're here to, to ask, do we need God? arguably the most profound question of all time in an hour or so, so we need to get going here really soon. But um, I, I just wanted to share a couple of thoughts with you before we get going. When, when the Fixed Point Foundation first asked me to moderate, my first question is, well, why would a faith-based organization want to give a stage to an opposing viewpoint? And Larry, who you'll meet in a moment, said, uh, this question is too important not to engage a conversation about it, to get people thinking about it. And then I thought, well, maybe it's the fix is on. Maybe he's set this all up so he's going to win tonight. But <laughs> No. <laughs> then I found out <laughs> that Shermer was in the opposing viewpoint. And I've interviewed him for television before. He's a pit bull. So I'm really, really excited to hear what, what these two are going to be saying. In fact, let's, uh, let me introduce them to you now so we can get started tonight. Um, Michael, I'll start with you. Uh, Michael Shermer is the founding publisher and editor-in-chief of Skeptic Magazine. He is a columnist for Scientific American and a regular contributor to the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, and Science Magazine, among others. He is the author of The uh, Believing Brain, The Mind of the Market, Why Darwin Matters, The Science of Good and Evil, and most recently, The Moral Arc, how Science and Reason Led Humanity Toward Truth, Justice, and Freedom. And after you've read that title and subtitle, you've read half the book. So <laughs> you'll be able to buy that in the lobby, by the way, later on. Uh, Shermer has appeared on The Colbert Report 2020, Dateline, Charlie Rose, and Larry King Live, and as a featured speaker on the TED, uh, TED Talk. So please welcome Michael Shermer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Larry Taunton is the uh, author, columnist, and the founder of, and executive director of the Fixed Point Foundation. He has debated such high-profile atheists as Christopher Hitchens and Daniel Dennett, as well as Muslim cleric Zaid Shakir. Taunton also organized and uh, moderated all four debates between Oxford professors Richard Dawkins and John Lennox. He's been featured in debate on CNN International, Al Jazeera, and Fox News. And you can find his columns on uh, issues of faith and culture in The Atlantic, USA Today, CNN.com, and The Blaze. Taunton is the author of The Grace Effect and The Faith of Christopher Hitchens, which you'll also be able to buy in the lobby later on. It chronicles his friendship with the late atheist. He currently divides his time between offices in the United States and Europe. And please welcome Larry Taunton. Let me shake your hand, Larry. Thank you. I'm very gracious. Okay, so let's uh, lay out the ground rules here. I've got my stopwatch ready to go. We'll have opening statements from each gentleman, 10 minutes each. I'll uh, remind them with one minute to go. Uh, then we'll have rebuttals. Uh, Larry will go for five minutes, Shermer will go for five minutes, and then we'll have Q&A back and forth between these two for about 20 minutes, and then we'll have closing statements. Uh, Larry and, uh, and Michael have five minutes each on that, and then I'll have some summarizing comments at the end, okay? Can we cram all that in in an hour? And, and address the most profound question of all time. Let's get started. Uh, opening statement first to Larry. Well, Michael, you might want to check that seat for the whoopee cushion um, that we've um, placed there. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, it, is a, uh, it is a pleasure for me to be here in Seattle tonight, a place that was once in my childhood my home. 
and I've taken full advantage of it. On Sunday, I attended a Seahawks game, and on Monday, I bicycled some 60 miles of the Burke Gilman Trail. You live in a very beautiful city, and it's a real privilege for me to be here. And what a strange day this has been. My day started with a bizarre exchange with Deepak Chopra, um, uh, who was going after me on Twitter, and, uh, and it ends this evening with a uh, discussion with an atheist on this stage. And Michael, I must say, however irrational I think your worldview is, uh, you are a picture of rationality in a fortress of logic uh, compared to Chopra. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> the topic we're debating this evening is simply stated, do we need God? As we begin, it is perhaps worth noting that this is not the first time that Michael and I have matched wits on this issue. Uh, I not only know my opponent, but I like him very much and I enjoy his company. We also share a deep concern for the growing threat of radical Islam. Even so, there are points upon which we differ, and the focus of this debate is one of them. Since 9-11, the so-called New Atheists uh, group uh, to which Michael has the dubious distinction of membership, uh, have been busy revising both past and present in an effort to eradicate religion, Christianity most of all, from public life. These ivory tower theorists never tire of telling us that the world would be a better place without religious influence. Atheism, they say, is the way, the truth, and the life. Now, where I agree with the new atheist is on the point that some religions are, uh, indeed, uh, irrational and dangerous. I'm very grateful for the new atheist having the courage to speak to the very real dangers of Islam, where many have grown silent and uh, refused to acknowledge the obvious link between Islam and terrorism. Now, I want to be very clear from the outset that I'm no defender of mere religion. I'm a defender of Jesus Christ and the faith that he authored and the hope that he offers to Michael no less than to me. So in the time that I have, I would like to offer three compelling reasons why we need God, the Christian God, in our society. More than that, I wish to point out that none of us want to live in an atheistic society. First of all is the stark difference in how atheism and Christianity view man. In the Christian view, man is a moral and teleological being made in the image of God. He has intrinsic value as the pinnacle of God's creation. Moreover, he is an eternal being insofar as he possesses a soul. From the atheistic perspective, man is nothing more than an animal. As a consequence, there is no consideration of and no room for his non-material needs, hope, love, faith, freedom or purpose. It is this impoverished concept of humanity that has led atheists like Princeton's bioethicist Peter Singer, perhaps the most philosophically consistent atheist that I have ever met, to advocate infanticide in some instances. And why not? If there is no God, then there is no such thing as sanctity of life. You are an animal like any other, and we may, therefore, choose to put you down when you have outlived your usefulness. Singer has simply taken atheism to its logical conclusions. Second, but related to the first point, is the appalling record of atheistic regimes. Atheism is the reason why communist states have historically treated human beings as commodities. John Lennon famously sang, imagine there is no heaven. It is easy if you try. No hell below us, above us, only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Like the so-called new atheists, Lenin spoke about such a world as though it would be perfect. Uh, he could not have been more wrong. There's nothing new about atheism but its slick new packaging. And when you strip away uh, from it the glory of the universe and life marketing, what you find at bottom is an intellectually bankrupt and pitiless worldview. But Lenin was right about one thing. It's easy to imagine a world without God if you try, because we've seen this movie before, and it's a real stinker. So as we begin tonight, ladies and gentlemen, let us take this question out of the realm of the theoretical and consider it historically. Russian socialists, to use only one example of an atheistic regime, did more than imagine 
the godless world John Lennon sang about. They built it. For more than 75 years, the world's atheistic elites had their way with foreign and domestic policy, the military, the economy, the secret police, and the lives of countless millions of people. The result? Seven decades of unremitting turmoil, bloodshed, famine, theft, backwardness, incompetence, and continual promises of a coming utopia. An atheistic state is no utopia. In his great novels, Demons and the Brothers Karamazov, Dostoevsky predicted that if Russia's communists, if Russia's atheists ever gained control of the levers of power, it would lead to the expulsion of Christianity from public life, and with it, the annihilation of morality, the rise of totalitarianism, and the proliferation of state-sponsored genocide. He would prove prophetic. Of course, the expulsion of Christianity from public life is necessary for anyone seeking to build a despotic regime. Christianity, by its very nature, subverts tyranny insofar as it teaches that there is a God whose laws supersede those of man, any man. This goes far to explain the antipathy of communist and fascist atheistic regimes to Christianity. They well understood that Christians do not recognize the power of the state as absolute. Moreover, where temporal law and eternal law are in conflict, the Christian may, in good conscience, violate the former while clinging to the latter. By contrast, atheistic regimes exalt the state in the place of God. And if Russians thought life under the czars was tough, and it unquestionably was, the communists would introduce them to horrors so vast in scale that it beggars the imagination. Figures vary wildly, but by conservative estimates, no less than 60 million people would lose their lives between 1917 and 1991 under Soviet atheistic rule. Any government that atheism has given us hits wide of the intended mark. And how could it do otherwise? In the biblical worldview, the state is a temporal institution meant to serve man, an eternal being. In the atheistic model, this is reversed. Man, a temporal being, serves the eternal state. The 20th century, ladies and gentlemen, was an experiment in atheistic governance that witnessed the murder of no less than 130 million people. This is because atheism exacerbates our darker impulses. But these facts do not trouble the new atheists in the slightest. Now, Michael will deny the obvious link between atheism and the aforementioned regimes, and I have yet to say anything of the atheistic fascist regimes because it just feels like piling on. But Michael has to deny this. History, however, is against him. But Michael's not alone in denying it. In his book, The God Delusion, Richard Dawkins argues that while Stalin was an atheist, there's no evidence that his atheism was the motive for his crimes. It's an absurd point. Whatever Stalin's motives, bitter jealousy, rivalry, hatred for his fellow man, or power, the evils he committed were surely the product of his atheism. No one does anything for the sake of atheism as though it were an entity to be appeased. Indeed, atheism has no creed, no principles, no philosophy, and could give us no guidance. It is but to have a settled disposition on a singular question. One minute. Is there a God? From that, however, many dominoes can and often do fall. Finally, the world would literally be a poorer place were atheism ever to eclipse Christianity. And this is because, according to the data, ladies and gentlemen, the average Christian, this is according to the Barna Group, the average person who calls themselves a Christian, which we know in this country is a very large number, gives three times as much of their money and of their time to charitable causes. The average evangelical gives 10 times as much of their money and their time to charitable causes. So do we need God? History says yes. Michael, the burden of proof is on you because there is no evidence that the world you would give us would be anything but worse. Thank you. Perfect timing, by the way.
You were one second short. Excellent. <laughs> Michael, you're up. Thanks. <laughs> I'm going to build a wall. No. <laughs> <laughs> Do we need God? Uh, no. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so uh, Larry had three reasons why we need God. I'm going to give you ten reasons why we don't, if I can get through ten. Number one, Ben Carson, or religious ignorance. Only belief in God could infect a brain as smart as the renowned neurosurgeon and leading prominent presidential candidate Ben Carson to mangle the Big Bang Theory and preposterously propose that Darwin's theory of evolution is a trick of Satan. He said it. Number two, Kim Davis, or religious bigotry. Only belief in God could convince an otherwise decent and loyal civil servant that her personal interpretation of the Bible trumps the U.S. Constitution, the Supreme Court of the United States, and the law of the land. Number three, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and Islamism, or religious extremism. Only belief in God could lead large groups of people to believe that the most moral thing they could do is to murder people in the most gruesome manner possible, imaginable, beheading. Anyone who does not believe in their barbaric and primitive religious tenets, such as capital punishment for apostasy. Number four, the Crusades, the witch hunts, and wars, or religious violence. Only belief in, peop in God uh, could lie behind these catastrophic moral blunders through crusades, the People's Crusade, the Northern Crusade, the Albigensian Crusade, and Crusades 1 through 9. <laughs> 6 and 7, not so bad, 8 and 9, yeah, anyway. The Inquisition, Spanish, Portuguese, and Roman. Witch hunts, the execution of tens of thousands of people, mostly women. Uh, Christian Crusaders, extermination of native peoples around the world by the millions maybe tens of millions. The interminable European wars of religion, such as the Nine Years' War, the Thirty Years' War, the Eighty Years' War. You thought Iraq and, and Afghanistan were bad. The French wars of, Revo of, of religion, the wars of the Three Kingdoms, the English Civil War, even the American Civil War, in which Northern Christians and Southern Christians slaughtered one another over the issue of slavery. And the First World War, in which German Christians fought French British, and American Christians, all of whom believe that God was on their side. You can look up and see these belt buckles that German soldiers wore in the First World War that said, Gott mund, Gott mund uns, God is with us. And that's just the Western world. There are seemingly endless religious conflicts in Indonesia, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iraq, Sudan, and numerous countries in Africa, and of course, Islamist terrorism. Five, slavery and civil rights, or religious intolerance. Only belief in God kept the slave trade alive through religious and biblical arguments that blacks were inferior to whites, that slavery was good for black souls, we're saving their souls. Slavery gave blacks civilization, this is good. That blacks liked being enslaved, or later, uh, that blacks should not have the same civil rights as whites, such as equal treatment under the law. For example, interracial marriage was illegal until 1967. Remember when that was a thing? No, I don't either. I mean, what? Blacks should not marry whites? What? But that was a thing that Christians used to argue was a legitimate argument to make. Number six, women's rights or religious suppression. Only belief in God would lead otherwise good men to think that women should not have the same rights as they, which is what almost all Christians believed until the women, women's rights movements in the 20th century. Uh, and many today still believe in wanting to control women, uh, women's sexuality and reproductive choices. Like the meddling puritanic control freaks of the early modern period, there are still men today who think they should decide what women do with their vaginas. Women flourish in societies that are either not religious or, like the, like the United States, separate church from state. In other words, less religion equals more rights and equality for women. Number seven, gay rights or religious moralizing. Only belief in God could cause otherwise decent Christians to become perversely obsessed with what other people do with their genitals in the privacy of their bedrooms. And that if these people don't insert their genitals into the biblically correct orifice, 
or if their genitals are stimulated in a biblically unapproved manner, <laughs> they should not have the same constitutional rights as straights. Seriously? Yeah, as you've noticed, that has been a thing. Eight, tribalism or religious xenophobia. The world's religions are tribal and xenophobic by nature, serving to regulate moral rules within the community, but not seeking to expand the moral sphere to include those outside the circle. Religion, by definition, forms an identity of those like us in sharp distinction from those not like us, those heathens, those non-believers, unbelievers. Uh, in, in, in much of the world, be, being an atheist means, if you're a Christian, you're an atheist. You're, you're just, you're an apostate. You're a, you're a heretic if you don't believe a particular religious belief. Most religions were pulled into the modern enlightenment with their fingernails dug into the past. Change in religious beliefs and practices, when it happens at all, is slow and cumbersome and is almost always in response to the church or its leaders facing outside political or cultural forces, such as civil rights movements and the abolition of slavery. Nine, absolutism or religious dogmatism. Uh, so here the, the problem is, is that the foundation of the of belief in, in an absolute morality, there is a transcendent Archimedean point out there where we can discover real moral truths, uh, is the belief in an in absolute religion and, and a one true God. Uh, unfortunately, the creator of the universe wrote more than one holy book that tells us what these rules are, and they don't always agree, so which is the right one? So this is the problem, once you depart from the truth, according to this particular set, then you are a heretic, you're outside that. You are no longer part of our moral sphere of, of moral consideration. Uh, and therefore, unlike science, religion has no systematic process, no empirical method to employ to determine the verisimilitude of its claims and beliefs, much less right and wrong, so it can never self-correct its own mistakes, which are legion. And finally, number 10, the preposterous moral rules or religious immorality. Uh, the morality of the holy books, most notably the Bible, since that's what we're talking about here, is not the morality any of us would want to live by. Put into historical context, the Bible's moral prescriptions were for another time, for another people, and have little relevance for us today. Uh, in order to make it work, you have to cherry pick the Bible. Thou shalt not kill in Deuteronomy. Okay, it sounds good. Thou shalt not wrong a stranger or oppress him, for you were strangers in a strange land, uh, and so on. That sounds great, uh, but those are tucked in between uh, a whole series of these stories uh, and moral commands, uh, such as Deuteronomy 20, 10 through 18, in which Yahweh instructs the Israelites on the precise etiquette of conquering another tribe. When you draw near to a city and fight against it, offer terms of peace to it. And if the answer to you is peace and it opens to you, then all the people who are found in it should do forced labor for you and shall serve you. Okay, so that's the nice thing, you enslave them. But if it makes no peace with you, makes war against you, then you shall besiege it. And when the Lord your God gives it to you in your hands, you shall put all its males to the sword, kill all the guys, but to the women and the little ones, the cattle, the women and cattle, and everything else in the city, all its spoils to you, booty for you. Nice. Uh, consider it what the great Moses did with an army of 12,000 troops in Numbers chapter 31. Uh, they warred against the Midian. Uh, the Lord commanded Moses and slew every male. They slew the kings of Midian and the people of Israel took captive the women of Midian and their, lo and their little ones. And they took booty as their, uh, all their cattle their flocks and all their goods, all their cities and the places where they dwelt, and all their encampments they burned with fire and took all the spoil and all the booty, both of man and of beast. One then they brought the captives and the booty and the spoil to Moses. Now that sounds like a good day's pillaging, <laughs> but when the troops got back, Moses was furious. What do you mean you didn't kill the women? He asked, exasperated, since it was apparently the women who had enticed the Israelites to be unfaithful with another god. Moses then ordered them to kill all the women who had slept with a man, but save for yourselves every girl who has never slept with a man, he commanded, predictably, at which point one can imagine the 32,000 virgins who had been taken captive rolling their eyes and saying, oh, God told you that, did he? Right. Was the instruction to keep the virgins for yourself what God had in mind by the word love in the love commandment, love thy neighbor? I think not. Of course, the Israelites knew exactly what God meant, and this is the advantage of writing scripture yourself. You get to say what God meant. 
And they acted accordingly, fighting for the survival of their people with a vengeance. Time. Add up those 10 reasons. I think we can do well without religion or God. Thank you. Larry, five minutes to rebut. I, uh, I feel like a mosquito in a nudist colony. I, I barely know where to begin. Um, <laughs> Michael, I must say, you lost me somewhere around vagina and, uh, and booty. Um, I will try to respond to this as, uh, as systematically as I can. First of all, I mean, Okay, I mean, if we want to go through all of the stories in the Old Testament, if you'd like, uh, there's a few in the New Testament, by the way, but if you'd like to go through all the stories and, and, uh, and discuss those, and I mean, th this kind of discussion, ladies and gentlemen, can often become a body count, and it's not particularly helpful. It's definitely not helpful to, to Michael's side of the argument, because, because atheism loses decisively if that's the way we want to play it. We want to talk about... Um, uh, the, the witch trials, and we want to talk about um, the Inquisition and so forth. Um, but let me begin with the latter first, um, those, those historical things that took place outside of Scripture, like the Inquisition. Uh, these were not Christian things. If I go over to Jeff here and I strike him and I say, in Jesus' name, this does not make it a Christian act. It does not make it holy uh, by calling it Christian. That which is not anchored to Scripture is not uh, um, Christian. Now that said, um, Michael has referenced um, uh, violence in the Old Testament, and uh, this is this is a, this is an interesting uh, interesting topic. But I have to tell you, this is the kind of thing that has to be in context. I mean, we can have a conversation about Numbers chapter thirty-one, but it's important that you understand what happened at Baal Peor in order to understand the context of what happens. In, uh, in Numbers chapter 31, because then you understand that those women had led uh, some 24,000 Israelites to their deaths. So the way Michael would tell the story is, hey, keep them for yourself. Keep them as the booty for yourself. They were deemed to be a national security risk. And it, let's, let's also um, put aside the notion that this is somehow new to us, ladies and gentlemen. Do you think that in the modern age, your, your freedom is not preserved with killing? It is. We drop leaflets um, on uh, uh, Japan and gave them the opportunity, the same opportunity of which he's referring to here, to turn, to repent, and then the atomic bombs were dropped. This is, in other words, what you see in the Old Testament is no different than what you would see in the modern age. I think it's interesting also uh, for us to consider the issue of slavery because this is the kind of revisionism that I was speaking of in my opening argument. Uh, it wasn't atheists who led the, the fight to end slavery. William Wilberforce was a Christian. The abolitionist movement was pioneered by Christians. Read leading historian, Southern historian Eugene Genovese, arguably the premier voice on Southern history, and he will tell you the very same thing. He will also tell you that yes, as Michael has pointed out, that there were many people who hijacked scripture and endeavored to use it to, um, to forward their particular arguments. But uh, again, it was Christians who led the abolitionist movement. It was Christians who led the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King Jr. from my, from, from, from my state, uh, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. The man was a Christian. And the man appealed, as I was trying to say to you in the opening statement, the man was appealing to a higher law. You see, if there is no God, ladies and gentlemen, there's no higher law. One You've minute. annihilated all any court of appeal. And all that you are left with is the laws of man. And the laws of man have no more validity than those rules that regulate a colony of ants. So I think these are things that are worth considering. Thank you. All right. Michael, five minutes. Okay, so, uh, well, empirically speaking, I can also demonstrate 
uh, which I do in the moral arc, why we don't need God, it, it's already happening. Millions of Americans have no belief in God at all, and tens of millions of Americans, about 40 to 60 million, depending on how you count it, are the nuns, the, the, the ones with the N-O-N-E-S that tick the box for nun, not the <laughs> ones that went to the Pope last week. Uh, they, they, they have no religious uh, preference at all. Now, they may, be, they may believe in some higher spirit in the sky or Deepak's quantum consciousness God or something like that, but these aren't in, in any way religious in the sense we're talking about here, a, a, and they're doing just fine. Tens of millions of people in Northern European countries such as Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Belgium, Holland, and Germany have no belief in God, very low rates of uh, religious belief and belief in God, and they're doing just fine by any measure. In fact, they are healthier as societies than the most religious countries in the world. I give you uh, uh, Gregory Paul's uh, massive data set, which I summarize in, in a long section in the Moral Arc. Uh, but look it up, Gregory Paul, he's just a terrific scholar. He took 17 first world prosperous democracies and created a successful society, society's database. Australia, Austria, Canada, Denmark, England, France, Germany, Holland, Ireland, Italy, Japan, New Zealand, Norway, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, the United States. Then he took 25 indicators of societal health, things like homicides, suicides, incarceration, life expectancy, STD rates, abortions, teen pregnancies, fertility, marriage, divorce, alcohol consumption, life satisfaction, corruption rates, adjusted per capita uh, income, income inequality, poverty, unemployment, and so on. And then on a scale of one to 10, how religious is each country as defined by like sociologists of religion do? Uh, you know, do you believe in God on a one to 10 scale? Uh, you know, how often do, are you a biblical uh, literalist? How often do you go to religious services once a week, you know, once a month? Easter and Christmas, so on. Uh, so church attendance, prayer, how often do you pray, belief in an afterlife, and, and, and so forth. Uh, so the upshot of it is, of these 17 countries, the United States is by far off the scale the most religious. Uh, but, you know, like an order of magnitude, high, well, not an order of magnitude, but you know, many tens of percentages higher than all these other countries in religious belief. We also have, as you know from watching the news, the highest rates of homicides, suicides, incarceration rates, STD rates, teen pregnancy rates, abortion rates, divorce rates, income inequality, and poverty rates. Now each of these particular things, I know because I'm a social scientist, has their own set of causes and why these things happen. But my point is that if religion is so good, if belief in God is such a great prophylactic against social ills and immorals, why is it not working here? Why is in fact it's the opposite effect? The most secular countries in Europe have the lowest uh, rates of these particular social ills. So if religion is so good, it isn't working here. Um, now, to your couple of points there to make. Um, William Wilberforce was a, a Christian crusader uh, who not only crusaded for the abolition of slavery, but he was really particularly bothered by the slave trade and also the behavior of of Englishmen everywhere in everything they did. He was just sort of a meddling kind of guy. The abolition of slavery, that's a good thing. But he wanted to control people's drinking behavior, their language, the way they dressed. He was just one of those sort of Puritans, you know, one of those guys that knows that somewhere somebody out there is having fun <laughs> and we've got to root him out. <laughs> Seriously, I wrote about this at length in the Moral Arc. You can read about that. Um, and in fact, of course, the point is that, yes, he did uh, lobby for the abolition of the slave trade for decades. Why was he unsuccessful for decades? Because all his fellow Christians were opposed to him, and they quoted biblical scripture. They made elaborate arguments from uh, theology and from Christianity of why slavery was so good and why he was wrong. Okay. Dr. King was, uh, of course, a, a, a pastor. He was reverend. But he, in his own autobiography, said that... One minute. His own autobiography said that it was a Gandhi was his hero. The whole strategic, nonviolent uh, revolutions and civil rights movements was the way to go. This had nothing to do with his Christianity and everything to do with strategic uh, moves to get people to change the laws and, and then eventually people to change their minds. Um, and then finally, if there is no God, there's no higher appeal, there's no higher source, Archimedean point as I like to put it. Okay, but the problem is, is that which one? As I said, the author of the creator of the universe wrote many religious books, holy books, ultimate authorities for moral right and wrong, which is the right one? How do you know? Science at least has some mechanism for determining what's more likely true or less likely true. 
It's either getting warmer or it's not. It's anthropomorphic global warming or it's not. We can find an answer to the question. What, what does religion offer for, you know, how do you know what's right or wrong about abortion or um, stem cells or what, how do you decide these things? Most of this is not even in any of the holy books. If it is, this one disagrees with that one. Time. How do you know? You don't. And that's the problem with religion. Thank you. Now we turn to uh, what I think might be even more fascinating, and that is they get to ask questions of each other. And if you two will allow, I'd like to also ask each of you one question at the end. Um, why don't we begin uh, with Larry? You can start with your question for Michael. I was lost in a haze of, uh, of data there, and I, I do want to say um, if you study Gandhi, you'll discover that Gandhi's model was Jesus. So um, in any case, it's, uh, he says so in his own writing. Michael, let me ask you um, this question. Of our two worldviews, um, yours, atheism, mine, Christianity, which one do you think restrains our darker impulses and which one exacerbates them? Well, my worldview is not atheism. Uh, world, atheism is not a worldview. It is not even a thing. It's just, we just don't believe in God, end of story. I am an enlightenment humanist. I believe in science and reason. I believe in rights and love and compassion and so on. I believe in a whole series of positive things that have nothing to do with atheism. And so, in, in short, no, but, but from but in that short, secular humanism, enlightenment comes. reason is a far superior uh, uh, system because it led to the development of, of constitutional republics, of liberal democracies, of the rule of law, and that's what restrains human nature. Not, not religion, per se, although some religions can do that as internal policemen, but ultimately you really need some kind of set of rules, and it's a rational society that gave us those rules. Um, I, I guess the point that I would, would make in regards to that, Michael, is that um, um, atheism, I agree with you, atheism isn't a, uh, isn't a system of thought, as I've pointed out in my opening statement, but from that proposition, um, many things do fall. And certainly one of them is uh, the view of human nature. Um, and if you believe that there is no God to judge in the next life, our actions in this one, um, all moral imperative is lost. And there's no compelling reason why I should not do as I would want to do. Okay, so, well, we have a human nature that we can agree on. We have a dark side, we have a good side. It's not so simple as, you know, atheism can't control our dark side and Christianity can. It's not the job of atheism to do anything. <laughs> That's the job of what societies are for. That's why we live in communities with laws and rules and so forth. Uh, and, and without that, you know, all hell breaks loose. The, you know, the dark side of our nature does come out. Even, even with religion, or in many cases, especially with religion, is what enables that to happen, as we've seen just in, in recent uh, news events in the Middle East, for example. Uh, you know, when, when governments like Syria fall apart, when they have civil wars, that's when particularly religious extremists come in and can drive the darker side of human nature. So, um, in short, my argument in the moral arc is that ever since the Enlightenment, we've been shifting the emphasis from moralizing about bad, sinful human behavior to what can we do to solve this problem? Homicide rates or suicide rates or STD rates or abortion, whatever it is, what can we do to lower these social ills? What's the solution to the problem? Maybe religion, maybe not. Maybe we should try this, try that. It's, it's an experimental method and that's what we've been doing for centuries and that's why things have gotten better. Question? Oh, question, yes, okay. Um, Okay, so um, as you know, Kim uh, Davis refused to give uh, grant uh, uh, marriage licenses. Do you believe that uh, it's called religious freedom, but really it's just an individual's personal beliefs about what they think is right and wrong should trump the Supreme Court, the law of the land, the U.S. Constitution? If it's an immoral law. If it's an immoral law, how do you know? Well, this is a, a point I've been seeking to drive home this evening. There must be a higher law. You must believe in a law giver for there to be absolute moral right and wrong versus, ladies and gentlemen, where uh, uh, there is a, a modern trend um, towards uh, adhering to the cultural zeitgeist. This is the, 
the, the German word which means the spirit of the age. And it sounds really good and it sounds really sexy until you begin to think about um, what was the cultural zeitgeist on the question of slavery in 1860 America? It was pro Slavery. What was the cultural zeitgeist on the so-called Jewish question in 1933 Germany? It was anti-Semitic. Adhering to the cultural zeitgeist is no way to determine ultimate right and wrong. There must be absolute laws if we are to have any uh, 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 recourse uh, when we find ourselves up against those laws that we find oppressive. Uh, but, but, but Kim Davis is reflecting the moral zeitgeist of the way it's been of discriminating against gays for decades. She's reflecting the moral zeitgeist. We have been you, standing you think up against... She's reflecting, you think she's reflecting the moral zeitgeist? Uh, totally. How, how many she of you totally are pro-break gay marriage? It's, it's, Raise your hand. Raise your hand. What? How many? I don't, th I, don't think, I don't think that she's reflecting the cultural Wait, zeitgeist. Your, no one heard The zeitgeist question. at all, Michael. <laughs> No, we didn't hear your, your question, question to the audience was how many of you what are, are pro pro gay marriage pro gay marriage <laughs> so you think that she reflects the cultural zeitgeist she's I think we saw here probably it, 90 percent she's reflecting the way it used to be because that's this is rare this is new this all just happened in the last couple of years Kim Davis became a Christian you know, she was not a Christian before. Now, now she's, uh, you know, uh, calling listen, on God's listen, word Michael, Michael, to discriminate I, I, against grace. Michael, she's one of these you're, Christians you're, that is obsessed with what people do with their genitals Michael, and which orifice it goes in. Okay, let's let him ask the next question here. <laughs> Orifices. <laughs> I didn't mean to get you all worked up, but uh, and booty. I mean, if you need God to keep control of that, okay, but. <clears throat> Michael, what is the nature of your hope, and what do you find hope and meaning in your own life? Uh, well, pretty much what everybody does. Um, a, a loving relationship with a significant other. I'm a parent. Uh, I have a dog. I have a home. I have a family. I have friends. My cycling buddies. I have meaningful work. Uh, and, 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 and my spirituality comes from trying to make the world a better place. Just, you know, the idea of moral progress, it promoting reason and science, because I can see that it, it makes the world just a little bit better. So that, that would be my spirituality. It, that's probably not the right word, but it's too, it's too much of a deepakish word, if you will. Uh, <laughs> Uh, for either we, you we or I going, to use the word. We were word. both going back and forth with Deepak Chopra <laughs> today, so just uh, so you know. Yeah, we are in agreement on that. Uh, but like for me, uh, for example, going to uh, Mount Wilson uh, and visiting the telescopes there, or any observatory, I visit them wherever I am traveling, and, and, and just to you know, stand inside the dome, which to me is, is like being in the, in the dome cathedral in, in Cologne or, or in Chartres Cathedral or something like that. It's just moving, but, but there's a, these huge instruments that can see photons of light coming from billions of light years away and landing on my retina. And to me, that's just you know, awe-inspiring. It, it, it is, in a way, you know, just spiritual in, in that sense. So Do I sense that's a follow-up question from you on this? I would just, I would only seek to, to make this point. I, I, to me, um, as someone who flirted with atheism for many years, uh, it seems to me that you arrive at a conclusion, if you really follow atheism to its, to its logical place, that there's no ultimate meaning in life, there is no hope, there is no justice, there's no purpose other than what you artificially create for yourself. And what I hear you saying is that you have artificially created it for yourself. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that's what I'm hearing. Not artificially. So in the sense that just as stars, they have a purpose. The purpose of stars is to convert helium into hydrogen. They have no choice. It's the laws of physics just drive that. And you can ratchet that all, all the way up to complex organisms and into humans. So the things I described, having a loving relationship with a significant other, being a parent, having a, a close uh, social network of friends and so on, everybody likes that because that's part of our nature. We're a social primate species. We're a pair bonding species. We know that when you're in love, you get a hit of dopamine and, and oxytocin and it's, it's practically as good as cocaine, not that I wouldn't know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I read, I read, and, uh, uh, and all those things I think happen 
consistently everywhere in the world because that's part of our nature. So what I'm saying is that perp it's not artificial. It's not made up. It's not you know, meaningless. It could have been this. It could have been that. Uh, no, that, that, the, the reason people pursue those things is because that is what truly uh, fulfills our nature. And so just like the star converts helium to hydrogen, we fall in love. We have friends. We have social community and that kind of thing. If, okay. if I may say this, uh, very, Michael. Very quickly. Please. I was loosely quoting William Provine, who you may have known, but who was the evolutionary biologist at uh, Stanford University and who said that there is no ultimate meaning in life. Okay, I, I understand. And Dawkins makes that, he used that sentence too. But, you know, they're kind of saying it in a technical way, in, in the way... You know, religious people say, well, there's ultimate meaning or what, okay, science doesn't give us that. Well, I'm trying to reconfigure in my work that how we talk about those things. And that, in, in fact, it isn't just there's ultimate meaning in God or there's nothing and, and that's it. Uh, no, actually, of course not. That's not the case at all. There's this huge, vast middle ground there that, that we can fill. So, Michael. I mean, you do the same thing I do. I, I'm pretty sure you get the same kind of fulfillment, you know, with your, your spouse and your kids and your bike rides as I do. Uh, because we have the same nature. You call it something else, uh, but it's the same thing. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's talk about uh, abortion, another um, a, a new and newsworthy subject here for the Republican debates. Um, so in the long history of, of civilization, uh, men have constantly oppressed women's rights, especially trying to control women's reproductive choices because that's one way of lording it over them especially when you can't lord it over them physically with violence because the laws now prohibit that. So this is sort of the last standing area is, why won't you grant, I presume you're pro-life, pro we're all pro-life. Uh, the question is, are you also pro-freedom and pro-choice? Why not take that extra step and, and, and give women that, 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 you know, take off the chains, let women just make their own choices? I will take the position of um, our mutual friend, Christopher Hitchens, who was decidedly um, anti-abortion uh, in his stance. And, uh, and he said that he was because he said that the razor's cut, as he said, was a little too close. His mother had an abortion both before he was born and shortly thereafter. And he said, but for the grace of what, there go I. Um, I don't think this is about a, a woman's rights. I think this is ultimately about responsibility. And there are consequences for the choices that we make, both positive and negative, and taking the life of an innocent child, I do not see as a choice that should be on the table. Well, that's fine for you. And I would agree with you. I wouldn't make that choice either. But that's not any of my business when somebody else wants to do something different particularly in the case of rape or something like that, but even just a drunken night mistake. I mean, stuff happens. Shit happens, all right? Let's just say it. <laughs> and people make mistakes. Okay, With all so, due respect, Michael, I don't consider and, children shit. Well, and uh, that's just the way I view it. I mean, it. the idea that... I, I wasn't talking about children. I was talking about... I wasn't talking about children. I was talking about mistakes that people make, of course. Okay. Um, but, but, but so, um, you know, the argument that, well... You know, the, all babies should be born no matter what, uh, and that if you know Christopher hadn't been born, we wouldn't have had Christopher Hitchens, or if the woman had not uh, had aborted this fetus, maybe it would have gone on to become a doctor. Well, maybe the woman that died in childbirth would have gone on to become a doctor and saved babies, something like that. Um, and uh, and so again, historically, just this constant controlling of women in every aspect that men can do. And we've been slowly chipping away at that. To me, this is the last one, sort of holding out on this religious idea. Like, you know when it becomes a life. Look, uh, eggs are fertilized all the time and then are sloughed off by the body. If you're starting with, you know, the fertilization of the egg and that, that's when life begins, what about that? Well, God allows that. So God is now an abortionist. Okay, quick and, and response. So you, yeah, so. Quick response. And then... A quick response and then your question. Yeah, um, Michael, I think you're making a very powerful case for uh, uh, perhaps there should be some, uh, some moral standards for sexual conduct. Um, it seems to me that, that, uh, that, that, that perhaps there should be some rules posted on how we conduct ourselves as it regards um, these kinds of 
questions. But uh, again, I want to return to, to the question that I asked you earlier on, Michael, about, uh, about that which, which exacerbates or, uh, or restrains our darker impulses. Because if we, you believe, and I'm sure you do, that human nature is the same the world over, that is, that we're all essentially the same, then a question becomes, why is it that some societies are better or worse uh, to live in? And I thought it was very interesting what you were saying earlier in which all the data that you were, you were spilling out, that you conveniently avoided those regimes which have institutionalized atheism. And what do we find in those kinds of societies? That the only way that they can restrain the behavior of their population is they have to have a replacement for God. And that becomes Big Brother. It becomes the, uh, the police state. So you don't really think, Michael, that at the end of it all, that perhaps belief in God does serve to restrain us. And again, I'm not referring to some vague deity. You know, as you were saying in your opening statement about Islam, I mean, I, I will just, I will cheer you on in what you have to say on that particular point. But I'm speaking of the Christian God. You don't, you really don't think that atheism is fuel to our darker impulses. No. No, and, you can, and we can see why. You can see it happen historically right now in Northern Europe. These countries are mostly secular, atheist countries. And running off of the accumulated capital of Christianity, Michael, well, they have not institutionalized no, atheism. No, no, no. They have laws, they have rules, they have police. They Which have, are largely Judeo-Christian. Well, it doesn't matter what religion the police are. They have to enforce the laws. It doesn't matter what religion the courts are. The laws, they have constitutions and laws. This is well, gee, I thought that was the debate this evening. Well, <laughs> well I'm refuting this argument that, um, okay, that, again, atheism is not a worldview. You cannot say, well, Denmark has a lot of atheists and they're doing great or they're doing bad. No. Why are they doing well compared to America and all those uh, societal measures that I gave? Um, well, because they have things like universal health care. They take care of the poor. They have rights for women. Uh, they have equal treatment under the law. They have most of the stuff we have and a few other things that maybe we should have and maybe a few things we shouldn't have. You know, countries vary. But the idea is they're moving in the right direction of expanding the moral sphere to include everybody in it equally treated. It doesn't matter what religion you are. Michael, question yep, for Yeah, question. Right. So, um, yeah, so speaking of that, um, so we, we agree that we have a dark... Uh, you know, we have, we have our inner demons and we have our, our better angels. So uh, would you uh, be, be comfortable if all of a sudden in Seattle or wherever, <laughs> uh, there was no rules, no more laws, the police went on strike or whatever, the court said, we're shutting down, people can do whatever you, we want. And the vast majority of people in Seattle or wherever were Christians. Would, would you think, no problem, I'm not worried in the least, no police, whatever, it's okay because people believe in Jesus and they're going to be good. Really think that that wouldn't make you nervous? Well, it's a strange hypothetical because what you're telling me is that, first of all, that the Seattle would be all Christian. Now that itself would be very interesting. <laughs> well, let's see Forgive show me of hands. <laughs> as a boy from Bama, but I'm having a hard time imagining it. But again, to make sure that I understand your question, Michael, are you saying to me, if, um, if we're talking about a society that, is, that everyone in it is Christian, would I, have a, would I be nervous about there being no, as, uh, if I, again, if I understand you correctly, that there would be no um, uh, enforcement of law? That's right, yeah. yeah. It, this happens periodically. Well, of like course it, I would. Yeah. yeah. Why? Let's but, let but, him answer. Yeah. Well, well, why? I, I mean... <laughs> Because, I mean, it's a biblical claim, ladies and gentlemen, and it's one that flies in the face of an atheistic worldview, and it is a worldview. And that would be fun to debate that sometime, Michael, by the way. But anyway, um, Jeremiah 17.9 says this, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked above all else. Who can know it? In other words, our capacity for evil is extraordinary. And it's an interesting little book written by somebody who, was, who described herself as a secular Jew. That is to say, she wasn't particularly religious. A woman by the name of Hannah Arndt. She wrote a book called Eichmann in Jerusalem. It is a profound read. In it, she says, during the trial of Eichmann, 
What we did was we missed the central point that the trial should have taught us, and it is this, that evil nature of man, the banality of evil, as she called it, and the point that she was getting at in that is that we wanted to write off Hitler and his regime. All these people were maniacs. They were insane. And she says it lets us off the hook of exploring the deeper, darker questions of human nature. The reality is, yes, yes. I mean, God himself in Scripture instituted civil laws and the enforcement of those laws with his own people. So, yes, we must have, I mean, I mean this is what the Decalogue is. The Ten Commandments are, are just that. They are civil laws, rules that are posted and for which there are consequences. So, yes, otherwise Ferguson's and New Orleans and so on, um, L.A. riots, these kinds of things happen, we know, in places where the law ceases to be enforced. But if it's Christians that are doing the law-breaking, doesn't that refute, doesn't that gainsay your whole point of this debate? Not, not at all. No, not at all, Just, Michael. Because not, not that Christians are sinners, but your argument is that belief in God makes you more moral and less likely to riot or whatever. But that isn't no, the case. I, I want you to notice the way that I phrased my question. I said restrain our darker impulses. Michael, I, I make no claim, and I want to be clear to everyone here, I make no claim of being better than anybody in this room. No claim whatsoever. I will readily acknowledge that I am a sinful man and that I need the restraint of God upon my life because the bent of mankind is towards evil, not towards good. No one really believes that man is basically good. Do you believe your accountant is but No, 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 you don't. You don't believe, you leave the keys in the, you leave the keys in the beamer? You leave, you, you leave the keys in the beamer? You don't check up with the accountant? You just assume that everyone is basically good? Of course you don't. None of us act that way with things that actually matter in this life. So yes, I believe that there is a need for that which restrains us. But I don't think I would go so far as you might, Michael, because I think what we're seeing, and I say this as somebody who's in Europe for half the year, what is being created in Europe is a big brother state. You are on a camera, by, you are being viewed in London by no less than three cameras at any given moment. So does that lead to maybe people uh, not committing crimes? Undoubtedly. Is it a better society? I'm not sure. All right, moderator's question, one for each of you. Please keep it short because we're running long. So my question to you is, uh, it's often said that the Bible's account of creation is just so far-fetched to believe that uh, God in man's image created uh, the earth and the sun and the heavens in seven days, as it says, uh, that it's just Im impossible to believe something so far-fetched. But isn't it true that the opposite may actually be true, that the uh, evolution happened in a random way over billions of years, that life sparked from uh, chemistry, uh, perhaps even from stardust, as the scientists like to say, uh, and that this happened over such a vast space in time, quantum mechanics. Isn't that actually the more far-fetched version of what happened? <laughs> well, it, it's, uh, it's a fantastic story that also happens to have evidence behind it. <laughs> <laughs> you want to leave it at that? Well, sure. <laughs> that, were, <laughs> that were great. Moderate What's the question? evidence? Well, I mean, you know, uh, well, read my books, read Dawkins' book. I mean, read Krauss's books anyway. So. May I respond briefly to that? Yes. Briefly. Well, no, wait a minute. Um, it actually, gonna... it's a great applause line, ladies and gentlemen. It, it, it's not true. Um, I recall... <laughs> I recall, I recall sitting, sitting with Dawkins when a moderator asked him the question of how life began. And he said, well, once we have the laws of physics, and she interrupted and said, no, I mean, where did the laws of physics come from? And he said, well, now that's something we actually don't know. But once we have step one, then... Yeah, we okay. can explain life. Well, that's right. like saying once we have speech, we can talk. Okay. I mean, that makes no sense. I, I okay, need to, very, I need to step in here. Yeah, I need to step in here. Okay, so, <laughs> all right, first of all, it's not random. Evolution's not random. You know, the, the mutations may be random, but it's yeah. non-random cumulative selection over long periods of time right. to get the kinds of change we're talking about. And when we're talking about, um, you know, molecular genetic change uh, across many generations, like a thousand generations, 
10,000 generations, like how long would it take to ratchet up a mouse to an elephant size? Calculations have been done. Uh, to us, it seems like an interminably long time, 10,000 generations. But on an evolutionary time scale, in the fossil record, in the geological fossil record, you might miss it entirely. Uh, and, and, and so you know, the way we perceive things from a human time scale is very vastly different, which is why we need the inferential sciences and the convergence of evidence from multiple lines of study that constantly come to these same conclusions. You know, creationists have this sort of conspiratorial idea that the scientists are meeting on the weekends to get their story straight. I'm gonna say this way. It's not like that. They're uber competitive and very combative. And if this young guy could debunk the old guys there, boy, I can knock Dawkins off and show genes are not selfish, whatever the argument is, this would be great. You know, and when that, and it does happen. So, but so our confidence in these ideas where the laws of physics came from. We have answers to this, by the way. And, and so on. The, you know, they may be wrong, but what the point is is that we're trying to accumulate evidence and test hypotheses and grow closer and closer to a better explanation. Religion does nothing like that, not even remotely close. All right. Okay. Question for you. <laughs> is it yes. possible that two people can live exemplary lives and, in fact, identical lives, living them as you might believe Jesus or God would want them to believe? The only difference uh, is that one believes in God and the other doesn't believe in God. First of all, is that possible? Second, if, it's, if it is possible, would God allow both of them into a heaven? Um, okay, uh, the, the, the answer to the first part is yes, and the second part is no. Why not? And uh, that is for this reason, because um, first of all, I'm, I, again, I'm not making the the argument here that, that, that Michael as an atheist is, is going to become a genocidal maniac. That's not the, uh, that's not the point. <laughs> the point is rather that there's no compelling reason if you are an atheist not to do as you would want to do, as you, as you might um, please. As for getting into heaven, the first part of the, uh, the question sort of presupposes that God lets us into heaven on the basis of our merit. This is not the biblical argument. That's actually a Muslim argument. Muslims believe that you, you get into heaven on the basis of, uh, of your actions, um, of your goodness, as it were. The biblical argument is that, we are, uh, that, that heaven is only attainable by the grace of God. And what that means is, is that we acknowledge God's mercy and his love, and we acknowledge that we ourselves are not worthy of it. And so, to quote Jesus in John chapter 14, verse 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Now, what does he mean by that? That, ladies and gentlemen, is perhaps the most politically incorrect statement in all of Scripture. Because Jesus is there concluding, is, he's saying that there's no other means of attaining heaven but through him. Um, that he is the only way. Um, and so those who want to uh, see Jesus as merely a good moral teacher and uh, uh, want to appeal to the so-called red letters of Scripture have overlooked some very important statements that Jesus made about heaven. All right, thank you. All right, closing statements from each, five minutes apiece. And Michael, we will start with you. Five minutes. Uh, yeah, so today I'm, I flew from uh, Yale in New Haven to Philadelphia to Dallas-Fort Worth to Seattle. So it was a long day on this flight from Seattle to here, or from uh, Dallas to here. There's two guys sitting next to me, three and a half hours. They didn't say, say a word. And then in the last half hour, one of them brings up the Bible and Hal Lindsey and prophecy and the end of the world, and it's all coming, and Jesus is coming. And they're going back and forth, and then they turn to me and go, what do you do? I went, <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to bury my head in this computer. Well, anyway, so the guy sitting next to me, he's a doctor, you know, he's an ear, nose, and throat doctor here in Seattle. So I thought, wow, okay, a man of science. Uh, uh, now, what about, you know, gay, gay marriage and all that? Oh, no, well, you know, uh, you know, I work with a lot of gays, and, you know, I, I like them, I'm nice to them, and so on. You know, I got, a, I got him pretty close, uh, in which he, you know, he said, well, you know, we're all sinners, I'm like, well, well, what do you mean we're all sinners? Well, like, if I look upon another woman with lust, that's a sin. It's like, okay, so what's the point of this? Uh, if a gay looks at another guy, it's a sin? Yeah. What if, but if you look at your wife with lust, that's a sin? Well, no, that's okay. I said, and if a gay guy looks at his partner who he's married to with lust, that's a sin? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, he just kind of had to say it because I said, how do you know? It's in the Bible. Okay. This is the problem. You know, I could see this guy was humane. 
He was nice. He works with you know, gays and so on. No problem. He just couldn't quite give it up because it was there in the Bible. Give it up is what I said to him nicely. <laughs> um, uh, so the Bible, in fact, is one of the most immoral works in all literature. I'm just going to read just a portion here of from the moral arc, woven throughout begats and chronicles, laws and customs, is a narrative account written by and about a bunch of Middle Eastern tribal warlords who constantly fight over land and women, with the victors taking dominion over both. It features a jealous and vengeful God named Yahweh who decides to punish women for all eternity with the often intolerable pain of childbirth. Uh, and, and why? Why were women chastened this way? Uh, because it was for that one terrible sin, the first crime ever recorded in the history of humanity, a thought crime no less, when that audacious autodidact Eve dared to educate herself by partaking of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and worse, she inveigled the first man, the unsuspecting Adam, to join her in choosing knowledge over ignorance. For the appalling crime of hearkening unto the voice of his wife, Yahweh condemned Adam to toil in the thin and thistle-infested fields and further condemned him to death to return to the dust from whence he came. This is the story we're given in the Old Testament. Okay, I know, the New Testament. It's new. And, uh, you know, it's more humane and so on. But when did Jesus become a conservative? He said it's the poor who are more likely to get into heaven. He said you should take care of the poor. And by the way, he was never married, never had kids, turned away his mother on many occasions, told people to give away their belongings and join him, which is what cultists do. Uh, and not only did he not repeal all those uh, capital punishment laws in the Old Testament for things like working on the Sabbath and adultery, there goes half of Congress, and so on. <laughs> it, not only did I, he said, I, not, I did not come here to repeal the laws, I came here to reinforce them, to you know, come with a sword and make it even worse. He said that if you even think about doing something, you should have your eyes plucked out or whatever is doing the harmful sinning, that kind of thing. Um, so, um, you know, as an exercise in moral casuistry, this perspective taking question comes to mind. Did anyone ask the women in this Old Testament story how they have felt about this arrangement? No, and that's the problem. That's what we've been doing for centuries now, is expanding our moral sphere and asking people, how do you feel about this? Including, you can vote on it if you like, which makes a big difference when you have a voice in the process. Uh, and uh, so many Christians, in conclusion, say that they get their morality from the Bible. But this cannot be true. Because as holy books go, the Bible is possibly the most unhelpful guide ever written for determining right from wrong. It's chock-a-block full of stories about dysfunctional families, advice about how to beat your slaves, how to kill your headstrong kids, how to sell your virgin daughters, and other clearly outdated practices that most cultures, cultures gave up centuries ago. It's time we gave it up now, all of us, all of it, and work towards something better. Won't you join me? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Larry, five minutes in your closing. Well, you've been a fantastic audience, and uh, it's really been a joy for me to be here, and I thank you for coming and for uh, your respect um, this evening. Um, well, something that, uh, that Jeff didn't say is in our conversation um, at breakfast when I was talking to him about him being the, uh, the moderator for this, Jeff asked me, why would you choose Seattle? I mean, <laughs> there's hardly going to there's hardly going to be a friend in the audience um, for your position. And I said to Jeff, that's precisely why I'm here. At Fixed Point Foundation, um, we don't choose the lightweights. You know, I'm choosing to debate a Michael Shermer or a Christopher Hitchens or a Richard Dawkins for a reason. And we seek to go into the belly of the beast. And there's a reason for that. Penn Jillette, um, who is, uh, many of you will know from Penn and Teller, the, uh, the atheist illusionist, uh, extraordinary talent. Um, he posted a video blog, which you can find, and you should watch it. It's, it's terrific. And I found it very deeply convicting. Um, it's called uh, Penn Jillette Receives a Bible. And he tells the story of a man who waited after one of his, uh, his shows to present him with a Bible. And 
Gillette said this. He said, you know, I don't respect Christians who don't proselytize. How could it be that you believe that eternal life is possible and not tell other people? How is it that you could believe that hell is real and not warn them? How much would you have to hate me, he says, to not tell me that? It would be like a bus coming on towards me and you deciding to turn it away because you found it, to quote him, socially awkward. What convicting words. I'm here, ladies and gentlemen, to proclaim that love and that hope to you. I was someone, as I said, who, who flirted with atheism. And I must tell you, I, I thought it through very carefully. And as a high school student, I found myself asking very awkward questions of my, of my teachers. Let me get this straight. The construct of life is this. I'm supposed to spend the first 20 some odd years of my life getting an education because you say so. And then I'm supposed to get a job where I work for some 40 years or so, accumulating wealth because you say so. And then I'm supposed to spend the last 20 or so years of my life living off of that accumulated wealth and coasting into the grave as comfortably as possible. Is that it? Is that it? Is that all that you have to offer? Ladies and gentlemen, Christopher Hitchens and I took two lengthy road trips before he died. And this is a subject of a book that, um, that I've just written for HarperCollins that comes out in April, and I hope you will buy it in bulk. But <laughs> when Christopher and I, he was, he was dying at that time of esophageal cancer, and uh, we stopped at a roadside market. Uh, I was getting gas, and Christopher, we were studying the Gospel of John in our route. And uh, Christopher was standing at the counter as I came up to pay. And he was looking at all the BC powders, you know, and energy drinks and whatever there. And the woman had no, no idea who she was. We were in Johnson City, Tennessee. And Christopher was standing there like this. And he says, um, excuse me, but what is this? And he pointed to something called Notar. I've told you this story. And she said, well, you take that and you put it on the end of your cigarette and you won't get the tar or the nicotine. And Christopher says, oh, I wish I'd known. <laughs> I will say to Michael, I will say to you what I said to Christopher in our debate. And that is that I hope you do not reject the opportunity of eternal life that Jesus Christ freely offers to you and tumble into eternity and say, oh, I wish I'd known. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Nice job. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> very good. Fabulous. Well done. That was good. Thank you. Terrific, good guys. Job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> Well, we did it. We may not have solved the most uh, compelling and profound question of our time, but uh, we certainly gave it a good crack. I thought we did, Michael. <laughs> I want to say just a couple of house cleaning items. See, both of these fine gentlemen will be in the lobby. They'll be selling the books as well, too. Again, Michael's is uh, The Moral Arc. Larry's is The Faith uh, of Christopher Hitchens. And I think it's going to be a fascinating read, both of them. Um, I know you guys all enjoyed it. I could hear you yelling out there a few times. But it's because we care, and that's why we're here tonight. You're engaged, you care, you're passionate. And uh, as a newsman and a Seattle native, I applaud that. I want to thank you all for being here tonight, for caring about it. And let's give one more round of applause for these two fine gentlemen. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. And that will wrap it up. I'll see you in the lobby. Thank you for being here.